I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to TechSnap.org's monthly meeting for March 17th, 2022. I'm sitting in for Ruth Hoyt, and it's my pleasure to introduce a friend of mine as your guest speaker. Ben Cowan is an environmental attorney with a graduate and master's degree in marina affairs. Ben started scuba diving as a teen and has logged over 1,000 dives across the world. His images have been used on websites and in scholastic publications. And in this presentation, Ben will talk about essential elements of underwater photography, including the necessary specialized equipment and the limitations imposed by the marine environment. And Ben will also discuss how shooting underwater differs from shooting on land. So welcome to TechSnip, Ben. Thanks, Linda. And um, yeah, thank you all for, for having me here. Um, uh, as we were um, chatting just before the recording started, I do a lot of bird photography these days um, and uh, know Linda um, and others in here through that. And um, uh, I suspect um, that that's something that a lot of um, folks in TechSnap do. Um, and that underwater photography is something a lot of folks in TechSnap don't do. Um, so hopefully this will be something that um, will be new and interesting for you. Um, and if nothing else, at least you'll hopefully get to see some pretty pictures, right? I can um, guarantee they're going to see some pretty pictures because I've seen them and they're cool. They're really cool, Ben. So thank, thank you, you for doing this. Thank you for doing this for this group. Yeah, no, I'm always happy to talk about it. Uh, my family gets tired of me talking about photography to them. <laughs> so I'm always happy to talk about it with others. Um, so just a brief bit about me and how I got into the underwater um, photography. So I actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, where there's not much in the way of coral reefs. Um, but on a family trip when I was 15, took a resort course um, and just was mind was blown with how beautiful um, the reefs were. And so came home and decided to get certified. Um, which you can really do anywhere. And I got certified in Cleveland and um, did my checkout dives uh, in a quarry up in Northeast Ohio. Um, uh, but most importantly, I got my dad certified um, so that he would then take me on trips to cool places. Um, so I uh, started diving really 15. Um, at 16 years old, I was like, just thought the stuff was so cool that I was seeing that I had to start taking pictures of it to show people. Um, especially because back then this was in the um, you know mid 80s um, photography wasn't as widespread and so seeing the only way, place you'd really see underwater photography or underwater images was on like a well there wasn't a discovery channel back then so on PBS or on uh, um, if you were reading National Geographic so um, I got a camera called an Iconis 5 and I'll talk about that in a little bit um, and started shooting and I knew nothing about photography, had not, did not have a land camera. Um, but over the years started getting a little bit better at it, took some, some underwater photography classes while we were on some, some trips. And that was, um, helped me learn some of the basics of photography, um, and composition. And then also, you know, the unique aspects of underwater. Um, so, uh, I've now been shooting underwater for, uh, 35 plus years, although I do it much less now with work. It's a lot harder for me to travel, work, family, kids. It's a lot harder for me to get to some of those kinds of places and do that kind of diving. Um, and as we'll talk about, equipment underwater changes quickly. Most most of my really good stuff is film, <laughs> film cameras and everything, which aren't as useful these days. So um, anyway, so I, I started shifting to landscape photography and then wildlife photography. Um, and it was a real tough transition because while compositionally there's a lot that's similar, um, technically um, a lot of it is the polar opposite. Um, and so there's very different um, ways you have to um, you have to go about the process um, and just sort of different sort of rules you need to follow in order to make an image. Um, and so I thought I would talk about some of those differences um, and just sort of what goes into underwater photography a little bit and, um, and uh, then share a lot of pictures. So let me. Uh... 
So, is that, okay. All right, anyway. So let's um, jump into it, right? So some of the, just the fundamentally, right? Everything is different underwater. Um, light behaves differently underwater. Um, and what I mean by that is the visible light that we see, like the Roy G. Biv spectrum that we all know, doesn't penetrate um, the water column very far. Um, blue water does, and that's why you see, or blue light does, which is why when you see images from underwater, you have the blue water column. But you, you start to lose the reds, which is the, um, you know, the longest wavelength, um, at about 10 feet underwater. Um, and once you're you know, beyond 10 feet, something that's actually red um, appears brown or black. Um, and, the, and you lose the other colors, orange, yellow, green, blue. The deeper you go, the more colors you lose. Um, so you have to understand how light is behaving underwater. Um, your cameras behave differently underwater. Um, you're using a different kind of camera and there's, um, it's in many ways more cumbersome and there's just certain limitations to it, which we'll talk about. Um, of course, wildlife behaves differently underwater because you've got completely different kind of wildlife than what you're dealing with on land. And you behave differently underwater. Um, we are not made to be underwater. So we're wearing lots of um, bulky equipment and our, we have vastly more freedom of movement than we do on land, but our movement is also much more awkward and cumbersome. And that's something you have to learn to deal with. So um, obviously, you know, a prerequisite to underwater photography is becoming certified in scuba. Um, of course, you can do like little snapshot kind of photography when snorkeling and that sort of thing. But, you know, what we're talking about here is sort of more, um, more serious photography. Um, Good news is getting scuba certified is actually, you know, pretty easy. Um, and you can, you know, every city in town just about has, you know, a dive shop where you can get certified and they'll take you on trips to tropical destinations to do your checkout dives. Um, but you do need to get certified um, as a diver um, and you need to master what we call neutral buoyancy, which is, you know, you work on it in your scuba class, but neutral buoyancy essentially means properly weighting yourself with the equipment you have and your buoyancy compensation vest that you wear um, to be weightless underwater. It's probably the coolest part of diving is that you are weightless and you can just hover um, above a drop off that may drop 3000 feet straight down into the abyss. And you're just floating there like you're weightless, like an astronaut in space. It's really, really cool, but you've got to master remaining neutral because um, if you're trying to take pictures when you're, and you're not neutrally buoyant, um, you're either rising up or you're sinking down, you're just going to be fighting that, fighting that all the time and having trouble staying in position. And also very importantly, you end up damaging the reef because you, you're bouncing off of the reef below you or an overhang on top of you. So neutral buoyancy is absolutely essential. And so for that reason, Generally, they tell people don't start doing underwater photography until you are an experienced diver and you have mastered that skill. Um, the other thing you've got to consider is air consumption. Um, you're, you're on the clock when you're underwater and the clock you're on is, is, is um, limited by, by two things. One, the amount of air that you have in your tank and how long that will last you and two, how deep you are. Um, the deeper you are, the shorter your air will, the shorter time your air will last um, because you're under more pressure. And so a, it takes more air to fill your lungs um, and the less time you can stay because of um, concerns about avoiding decompression um, sickness or having to make decompression stops. Um, so on a deep dive, um, you may only have 20 to 30 minutes. Um, on a shallow dive, you may have an hour but um, you're trying to you know, shoot pictures and orient yourself and do a lot of things. So you have limited time to focus on photography. Um, body awareness, your control, when you're neutrally buoyant, when you're weightless, um, you, 
you, it's it's kind of comical watching people who are you know because you we're just not used to having to worry about the proprioceptors and where is my left foot which direction is it pointing and my right arm and everything people kind of tend to be all splayed out um not everyone is so graceful <laughs> probably including myself um and uh you have to dive with at least with a buddy and often in groups um and usually when you're um like in a you know at a resort on a dive trip you're diving with a small group and you've got a dive master who leads you around the reef for safety purposes um because it's very easy to get disoriented underwater um so you got to keep up and so that's something you have to be very mindful of is you don't get to just you know shut everything out and be single-minded um focus through your viewfinder the whole time you've got to be aware of where your buddy is where the group is um uh in, in order to stay safe um and then there is a tendency among photog underwater photographers to always be looking through your viewfinder and sometimes you just need to put it down and and turn around and look at the hammerhead shark that's you know cruising behind you not because he's going to eat you that doesn't happen but because it's really really cool and you tend to miss it if you're constantly staring through your viewfinder you miss all this amazing stuff that's happening because you are in a 360 degree world when you're down there um so those are all things about the environment that are very very different uh in terms of planning a dive um and your your shoot on a dive um it requires planning and it requires commitment and what i mean by that is you can't change lenses underwater and you, you you really can't carry multiple cameras you have to decide before you go on that dive um what do i want to shoot right and you may not know like a lot of times in the pre-dive briefings they will they will tell you here's what you're going to see on this dive and that can be very helpful to help you choose what kind of uh, what subjects you want to go after um but of course you never know what you're going to see on any given dive um and so you have to just make a decision. I'm going to shoot wide angle or I'm going to shoot macro. And you can have zoom lenses now with, with digital underwater, but, but even zooms are sort of limited by the, the port on the camera housing, which I'll show you later. Um, so you don't really get a full zoom range. And, and so you're still deciding, am I, am I shooting wide angle? Am I shooting macro? Um, or am I shooting kind of standard lens? Um, and you just have to make that decision. And I can just tell you that the absolute best way to ensure that you will see whale sharks mating is to take a camera down with a macro lens. Um, if you um, if you take the macro lens, you're gonna all the really cool wide angle stuff is guaranteed to happen just the way it is. Um, so um, the other thing you have to plan is you've, your buddy, you know, for safety, you always diving with a buddy. Um, two photographers together are the absolute worst buddies because each of you wants to go off and shoot what you want to shoot and stare through your viewfinder or what you want to photograph. And you lose track of each other real, real fast. Um, so um, best to be diving with someone who is not photographing and is willing to sort of follow you around and let you lead and know where you are so that you can focus on photography. Um, and you also have to be mindful of the dive master and where the group is so that you can keep up with them and not get essentially lost on the reef. Um, these are all things that you know, obviously when we're shooting on land, we have a lot more freedom. So what's different about um, underwater? Like I said, just about everything um the you know one thing you you have to get used to is that the water column itself becomes part of your scene um when we're shooting landscapes or when we're shooting birds we don't really think about the air right it's it's not an element of our composition but underwater it absolutely is um and having just a flat blue water column um, makes for a flat boring photograph having gradations of light and color in your water column makes for an incredibly interesting photograph and also helps impart the sense of depth so um, that's something you have to you know be mindful of um, particularly when shooting wide angle but really at all times 
Um, and you have to account for the water's effect on light. Like I talked about earlier, you lose the deeper you are, the more colors you lose um, on visibility. So underwater, like in, in, the, in the best tropical destinations with the clearest water, you might get 100 foot visibility. Um, but a lot of times you're dealing with visibility that's a lot less than that. Um, and so just like, you know, haze um, limits, you know, the kind of landscape photography that you can do because, you know, it really starts to make things lose, become hazy, lose focus, less sharp less colorful, um, that is magnified significantly underwater just with the normal water column. Um, so um, you really have to keep that in mind when composing your images. Um, you've got to get close to your subject um, underwater. Um, and when I say close, I mean often within inches or a foot, never more than six feet except for just background reef structure, for example. But um, anything beyond four to six feet in your frame is, is, is really not gonna be sharp, not gonna be colorful, um, and is really background. Um, now you can do some, get some really cool abstract shapes in the background with things further away, but primary subjects need to be very close. Um, so um, for that reason, it's like when shooting wide angle, um, whereas on land, you know, a 20 millimeter lens or something might be, um, or a 24 might be considered really wide angle. Underwater, we're shooting with a 15 millimeter lens that has a 120 degree angle of coverage or a 12 millimeter lens with a 168 degree angle of coverage, which virtually, you know, 180 degrees, right? Um, which that enables you to get, it enables you and requires you to get extremely close to your subject. Um, and when we, when I get into talking about strobes and under lighting, you'll see why that's so important. But those kinds of lenses are very, very popular and far more useful underwater than they are on land. Um, it also lets you really capture this amazing reef structure, um, the cool shapes and, and, I'll call it landscapes, but it's really reefscapes that you see. Um, and you, but you also need to get the sun in the frame and you get other elements in the frame. And I'll show you examples of that. Um, so um, what else is different underwater? Well, you're much more limited in secondary subjects. Um, they're a lot less static, right? Your secondary subjects tend to be fish, boats, and other divers. Um, and all of those things are moving. So now sometimes you get a, even, even a boat that's moored above you um, is swinging um, with the current back and forth. So those secondary subjects um, are, are constantly in motion and sometimes passing through the frame where you have very little time to actually compose um, the shot and get it. Um, the sun becomes a very a common and very important element you know, typically we don't shoot into the sun when shooting landscapes or wildlife, unless it's um, uh, unless you're capturing a sunset, you know, or sunrise, um, or you're shooting through, you know, through stuff to get a sun star or something. But we almost always want the sun in the frame when shooting, at least when shooting wide angle underwater. Um, but that does mean you've really got to keep an eye on your dynamic range because you cannot bracket exposures the way that we do so frequently on land. And, and I mean, and, and actually that's not exactly true. I do bracket exposures, but generally you're bracketing you, exposures to make sure you get one that's usable, um, but you can't combine them the same way because underwater, you can't set up a tripod and, and, and have the same framing. You're with the ocean with a little bit of, current or surge or movement and the 360 degree axis that you move on, you're sometimes between shots, you're gonna be several inches or a foot closer or further or higher or lower or left or right. And so lining that, that changes all the perspective and lining that stuff up, you know, in Lightroom or Photoshop becomes really, really difficult. Um, 
So um, now that we shoot digital, you know, fortunately you can, you know, you can expose for the brights and pull a lot of information out of the, the darks. Um, but bracketing is something that's important to still do, but um, you can't really use it the same way. Um, current is something else you need to worry about. Sometimes you'll be on dives with no current. Sometimes you'll have some current or surge. There are some destinations like Cozumel with are specifically drift diving where you are diving. You're not even swimming. You just get in and let the current take you along the reef and the boat sort of follows your bubbles and is there when you get up. And it's, it's, it's nice, but, um, and current can help really convey motion and subjects and so forth, but you can't, you can't stay still. So, um, you know, if you want to stay still to photograph something, you're having to swim against the current in order to keep yourself motionless. That really increases your air consumption. Um, and um, you really, so it, it complicates things. And so you have to be aware of all of these things and be able to sort of just adapt, right? Like the, the environment sort of tells you what you're going to be able to photograph on any given dive. Um, so I say it's important to plan, and it is, but you just have to understand that when you get down there, you're going to have to deal with it, whatever the conditions are. So, um, you know, different, you know, generally we, in underwater, you know, um, same sort of choices of photography as on land. You've got wide angle, you've got um, macro, and you've got um, what we call it wildlife, you know, call it fish photography, sort of more standard lens. Um, uh, wide angle is, is, you know, probably my favorite. It's also probably the most challenging. Um, but, um, it's really the best chance for those epic shots, those grand seascapes, the riotous reefscapes as we call them. Um, but to do wide angle photography, you've got to have the right conditions. Um, on land shooting, landscape photography, we always want to be out at the golden hour you know, or the blue hour, right? You don't have golden hours and blue hours underwater. That light doesn't penetrate the first few feet. Um, so when the sun starts going down and even just getting low, it just turns into dusk on the reef. Um, it could be a really cool time because that's when fish get really, really active feeding and everything. But for, for wide angle photography, you lose light real fast. And once you start losing light, it, it, it's like trying to do landscape photography at night, but with no Milky Way, right? It just, it's just black. So um, what you actually want for wide angle photography, you want to do it with bright sunlight um, and you want to shoot up at that sun, um, uh, overcast skies, um, which a lot, which sometimes we like, like particularly for wildlife photography, overcast skies give you just dark, flat light underwater. The reef is just flat um, and nothing other than what your strobes are illuminated. It has any color or anything to it. So bright sunlight where you get a nice sun ball is, is the best kind of condition. Um, and of course, good visibility is critical. If it's been raining the night before, you get a lot of runoff, mucks up the visibility. Um, and if you don't have good visibility, you know, it's your, your images are just going to be ruined. Um, and if it's, if it's really windy, you get high wind and waves, and that can really cause a lot of chop, particularly shallower. Once you get down beyond 30, 40 feet, um, that calms down a little bit, but you can still have some surge that makes it hard. You can't really brace yourself. You're moving back and forth more quickly, um, and the visibility can still be kind of mucked up. Um, so um, just a lot of different, many things that are very different than, than on land. Um, primary subjects, of course, are always important, and these are, um, you know, particularly true when shooting wide angle underwater. But one of the nice things is that if you're creative enough, um, there's a there's a, a, interesting primary subjects can be plentiful, and part of that's because they can actually be pretty small, and you're using such wide angle lenses and getting so close that you can really use the force perspective of a wide angle lens to make something that's pretty small in real life actually seem um, very big and impressive. Um, lastly, you, one of the things you see a lot in editorial underwater photography is the use of models, um, which can be great. They add interest, um, a secondary subject that you can control, but that takes a lot of a very skilled model who's got excellent buoyancy control, 
really understands where they need to be, how they need to be positioned, um, and uh, can avoid creating, you know, by with their fins or their hands, kicking up sand um, and stuff that creates backscatter in the image. Um, so all of these things are, you know, are, are challenging and just things you learn to deal with underwater. And, um, you know, from someone who, as someone who started underwater and then shifted to landscape, on the one hand, that was like, oh my God, this is so easy. But then on the other hand, like you're using completely different settings and, you know, um, techniques. So it's, it's a different set of challenges. So let's show some, some pictures now that I've kind of talked about it. This is um, probably what you're more interested in. But I'm just going to show you a variety of like wide angle shots here and give you a sense of just how sort of the kinds of compositional opportunities there are. Um, you know, this is um, a deep water Gorgonian sea fan. This is probably about 80 or 90 feet of water. Um, but this is an example of like a, kind of a cool subject, right? Cool color. But I didn't really have a secondary subject here. And it, it was a little bit of it wasn't a terribly overcast day, but the sun wasn't in a position where I could get it in the frame. So it's it it's a kind of a static composition, um, not as dynamic as some of the others you'll see. Um, so here's one. This is from Grand Cayman, a, a, what was a famous site called Trinity Caves, um, and this is um, a small um, cup sponge. That red, this red cup sponge here, is probably not much bigger than your two fists put together. Um, and this was a small sea fan, but I'm, I'm with a 12 millimeter lens and I'm about three inches from this. And so you get this wrap around, this cool wrap around perspective where everything looks like it's sort of dynamic and bending into it. Um, unfortunately, the sun was too low for me to get it up there, but I felt like the Gorgonian fans made good secondary Ooh. subjects in the background um, with the bright colors uh, of the, the reef in the, in the front. Um, here's an example of a model, um, using a model. Um, uh, and this, again, this was a pretty small sponge. It's less than probably a foot, a foot tall, um, but getting right on top of it um, and using a bit of force perspective, it looks bigger than the, than the diver. Um, and this diver here, she has really good body control and she's sort of in a in a, a pleasing position. Um, if I had asked, you know, my wife or one of my kids to model this, they'd be, well, you'll see a picture of what they look like underwater. So um, lots of challenges, but it can be neat because that's, this is a, this is just a boring picture without that, mo without that model as the secondary subject. Um, here's another one, um, just an image of just some rope sponges um, on a deep, a promontory deep on the reef. Again, would have been a really boring picture because the sun was blocked by clouds, which is why this looks kind of muted here. But this other diver swimming past um, was in a nice position and makes for what would be otherwise a really boring flat image into something that's, that's actually really cool and gives you a sense of depth and, and a sense of sort of motion and, and interest that it would otherwise lack. Um, and, and by the way, I'll tell you a lot of these images that I'm showing were taken on film because um, I haven't gotten to travel a bunch and do a bunch of wide angle stuff in years and years. Um, so these are scans of film, which is why um, I haven't edited out the bubbles, which is something that now we can do. We never used to be able to do that when shooting slides. Um, here's an example from, you know, this anemone um, becomes a a, a large primary subject sort of dripping off the reef and you get, you know, I didn't have any sun, another overcast day. So I used the divers doing a safety stop on the mooring line up here as a little bit of a um, secondary subject. Uh, but you can see how quickly this is only a, about, this area is only five to six feet away and it's already getting dark. And this is probably eight to 10 feet away and it's basically black. Um, you really lose light and color quickly underwater. So this is an image of my son modeling for me. And you can see, right, like he's he's trying to be conscious, but just you get, you know, all knees and elbows and, you know, he doesn't have his, you can't see his eyes because he's looking down the sponge instead of towards you. Um, I, I tend not to shoot with models very much just because it's 
it just complicates things that much more. I'll, I'll try to find, um, you know, other secondary subjects, usually the sun. But on this case, as you can see, we had kind of a murky green water because it had rained the night before and the sun wasn't out. And so I really, you know, and frankly, you know, just wasn't anything, if I didn't have a secondary subject, this wasn't a, even a photograph worth taking here. Um, but when you do get good conditions, um, you can get some really cool shots. This is in Papua New Guinea. And again, here I am right, like these red sea whips are touching my, my dome port on my camera but you have such incredible depth of field, you're generally shooting it. Uh, you don't really worry about diffraction underwater, right? Because the water is diffracting the light far more than your, you know, an aperture will. So you shoot it typically F8, F11, F16 all the time. Um, and you get tremendous depth of field with a 12 millimeter lens. So I've got everything from, you know, four inches to infinity in focus here. Um, uh, I've got, you know, the dive boat, swinging over the sun behind the sea whips um, and, and a really cool image, um, you know, from getting right on top of things. Um, here's another example of ultra wide lens and what you can capture. This is also with my 12 millimeter lens. And again, I'm six inches from this um, soft coral tree. Um, and this soft coral tree is about um, probably only about two feet wide, but get right on top of it and becomes this dominant um, feature in the frame and um, clouds of these are purple queen antheas, the fish and, and just getting, um, you know, those clouds of fish add so much interest. Um, and you can see the sun up here again, it was a little bit of an overcast day, but it, it, enough um, gradation um, from the sun giving you you know, the, the lighter blue to the darker blue, which gives you that sense of depth um, that makes this an interesting image. If I didn't have that sun there, it was all just flat blue, it just would be very boring. Um, one of the challenges you get though, when with, you know, schools of fish like this is that, you know, I've, there's a strobe up in the, on the left and the right here. And that's what's illuminating this, this coral tree. Um, and you know some of these fish get real close and they'll be you know they'll be in your frame and they'll be real close to the strobe and so they'll be super bright spots they'll overexpose themselves essentially so that's just something where you got to take a lot of images and fortunately you know now we have the ability with um you know with lightroom and, and photoshop to deal with some of that but back in the film days it was a real real challenge um here's another um, similar image this is one of my favorites from the red sea um, again, just beautiful soft corals dripping off the reef and um, the divers, you can see the bubbles um, here from the divers passing underneath me, which probably now I could go and remove those um, from this image, but um, that caused this, the school of, um, of antheas to come swimming towards me. So it's got a kind of a cool, you know, school fish coming straight at me. Um, I've got the sun up there to give um, a secondary subject and just gorgeous colors. And this is like a classic Red Sea reef scene. Uh, this image is also from the Red Sea, um, much, much shallower. So you get different kinds of corals. Um, but again, more like these fish made a great secondary subject. They were just, the school was just kind of cruising past me on the reef. And um, uh, was able to sort of capture them in the frame. And, but so you can see how incredibly bright the sun was here. I, on this shot, I'm probably in 10 feet of water. Um, and it looks like it's a little bit deeper because again, the, such a wide angle lens and forced perspective, but it's, this is pretty shallow. Um, sometimes it's, cool to just kind of focus on the shapes and, 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 and silhouettes, just like you do on land. So, you know, this was, I, in this one, this wasn't a particularly colorful scene. Um, this kind of Gorgonian sea fan is just kind of brownish green and there wasn't a lot of color on the reef. Um, this is in the Caribbean, which is as much as you hear about how beautiful the Caribbean is and, and it is, um, it is nothing compared to the South Pacific and the Red Sea. 
um, it's much less colorful and much less diversity. So it was kind of a boring image. Um, if I had fully illuminated the uh, the uh, Gorgonian, um, but shooting it with just a little bit of light to give you some hints of of the outline and everything and some depth to it um, and getting the school of fish, the sun, like I think makes for, this is actually one I like a lot, you know, just very sort of moody um, and ethereal to me. Now here's an example of shooting wide angle schools of fish. Um, this is um, an image from the Solomon Islands. Um, and this school of fish was, you know, school, these are um, barracuda. Um, that were schooling sort of on the reef. And I turned around and saw them and like, oh my God, I got to get that photograph. I'm with, again, with the 12 millimeter lens. So I had to get within a foot or two of this school. Otherwise the whole thing is going to look as distant as these ones up here do. Um, but, you know, fish are really better at swimming than, than people are. And so swimming over as hard as I, as hard as I could to try and just keep up with this giant school, they're effortlessly just gliding and I'm kicking as hard as I can to keep up with them, um, trying to be cognizant of how deep am I, how much air am I using um, and get close and frame it. And you've got strobes that you've got to get in the right direction and get your settings right and frame it right. It's an incredibly challenging shot to get. Um, and I was super, super happy with how it came out to be able to get the sun, you know, just peeking over the side of the ball of Barracuda. Um, you know, there's certainly aspects of it that I wish I could have gotten the entire school in there. I wish I could have been, you know, this, that, the other, but, um, this was, this was a pretty challenging shot to pull off. Um, and I paid for it with a nasty CO2 headache when I surfaced. Um, there's other cool stuff you can do underwater too. Um, even wide angle, right? Like this is this is actually shot with my wide angle lens, got right on top of this vase sponge and illuminated just the rim. Um, and I think it's just a really cool, almost abstract um, kind of thing, but very sort of alien looking. Um, shooting wrecks is something that can be cool. Um, so this is a wreck that's actually in Grand Cayman. It's pretty well known, but um, you know, people can swim through it um, and there's, so there's an air pocket that's collected in the top of the pilot house here, which makes for a cool reflection. Um, and, uh, this was actually my dive master, um, on the, but I got him to sort of pose and just capture the reflection. It's kind of a cool, um, cool effect. Not the kind of thing you can often pull off on land, although we do do reflections the other way, but we don't usually get the reflections above us in land. Um, this is a wreck of a, um, I think it's a P-51, a World War II wreck from the Solomon Islands. Um, didn't add any artificial lighting to this, just wanted to get the sort of that moodiness, um, you know, the, the underwater graveyard effect. Um, uh, just really, really in, in, incredible experience to be able to dive these World War II wrecks this is another one. And this is actually from Iron Bottom Sound in the Solomon Islands. So if there's any World War II um, uh, historians uh, in the group, um, you'll know about that. Uh, but this is actually the gun turret from uh, one of the sunken ships. And you can see it's been completely encrusted in sponges, corals. This is called a crinoid. Or this is actually an animal that can move, but just really, really cool, um, very out of place type element, right, for an underwater shot. Um, so um, let's talk about macro photography a little bit. You know, it, one thing that's interesting I've noticed is that um, among photographers on land, a lot of people sort of only do wildlife or they only do um, landscapes or they only do macro. I'd actually say that a majority of photographers probably stick to one of those disciplines. And most of the pros definitely stick to only one of those disciplines. Um, underwater, the pros shoot everything. And so does everybody else. Because again, you just sometimes 
the conditions, sometimes the site, whatever, you don't, you don't have the choice. Um, and so um, you sort of got to learn them all and, and take advantage of whatever opportunities you have. One of the nice things about macro photography is there's almost always something to shoot on the reef. Um, so when the lighting is bad, got a really overcast day, or if it's raining, like if it's raining really hard on land, you know, as long as it's not electrical storm, you can still go diving and guess what? It ain't raining underwater. Um, so you can still go dive and, and, and it'd be a perfectly enjoyable job, enjoyable dive. The service interval afterwards stinks, but the dive part's great. And um, uh, there's, um, if the visibility is bad or whatever, with, well, with macro, it's entirely artificial light and visibility doesn't matter because you're only photographing very small things and just from your lens. Um, it's also the best opportunity to really highlight how amazing the biodiversity of these reefs is and just all the tiny little critters that really make it so amazing. And that's macro photography. Um, it does require excellent buoyancy control because you're dealing, you know, with very small depths of field. And now you're trying to remain motionless in a dynamic underwater environment. Um, and you're moving the corals drift back and forth with the surge and the critters on the corals move back and forth with the surge. And so a lot of it is sort of timing and patience. Um, but you really do have a lot more ability to control your subject and your background and your framing when you're shooting macro than when you're shooting wide angle. Um, and there's just so, so many um, opportunities for creativity. So some of it is just documenting really cool stuff that lives underwater, like this little uh, cleaner shrimp on, a, on bubble coral. Um, nudibranchs are um, often called the butterflies of the sea. They're sea slugs. Um, but they're a heck of a lot more colorful than garden slugs. Um, they come in amazing uh, shapes and color patterns. Um, and, you know, this one here, and none of them really have, you know, some of them have common names, but most of them just, there's so many of them that are not even described. Um, so just beautiful colors and patterns. Um, this is a detail of one of the arms of a crinoid. Um, this is the same animal, if you remember, um, uh, where the, I'm sorry, this one, this is also a crinoid, but this is the close-up of, of a slightly different species of crinoid, but the arms sort of curled, um, just makes for a neat composition um, in my mind. Um, this is close-up of the arm of a crown of thorn starfish. These are actually a very invasive predatory fish that are devastating the Great Barrier Reef and are out of control. Um, sometimes just finding cute little elements and make, you know, this was just sort of my attempt at like a rule of thirds kind of composition using nothing but a little strand of halomita algae um, and some encrusting sponge in front of a star coral, right? There's, this is really like, if you were just looking at this on the reef, like it's nothing, but it makes for, I kind of like, the composition of it and the, and the colors. Um, this is sort of an abstract, but it's it's color, it's pattern. This is um, the the roof of an overhang under a, uh, on a reef, um, and under these overhangs, you get encrusting corals and and sponges that are incredibly colorful, but don't get any light. So you only see that color when you use your strobes to illuminate them. Um, these green things are tunicates. This is actually the most primitive member of phylum chordata, meaning the most primitive um, vertebrates in the world. Um, and these are encrusting corals, um, encrusting sponges. And this is an orange ball corallomorph, which closed up because it was I, they're very light sensitive and I'd already taken one image. But this is the arms of the orange ball corallomorph when it's open. It's almost this anemone looking thing with these bright orange dots on it. And it just kind of looks like a galaxy of orange stars, um, a really, really cool animal. They're not very common and they're very, very hard to, to find and even harder to photograph because of how sensitive they are. Um, soft corals are one of my favorite um, subjects. You saw pictures of these in the red, from my Red Sea photos. This is, the detail on these is incredible. Um, and these inflate, they'll, when there's no current, they just shrink down into little spiky balls. But when the current flows and brings the plankton and the nutrients by, 
they inflate into these sometimes small, but sometimes enormous trees. Um, and these are like calcareous spikes that help give structure to it. And these are its polyps and it's just filter feeding. Um, and these come in every color of the rainbow. Um, they're beautiful. Here's a yellow one, yellow and orange one. But you saw in some of my earlier photos just how colorful these things are. Unfortunately, we don't have this kind of soft coral in the Caribbean. Um, this is only found in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, individual coral polyps can be really cool. I kind of like this is just a, a, a very common thing called a sun coral, orange tabastria coral, um, that actually feeds during the day. Its tentacles are out in the day. But this top-down photograph, it just, I, I like it kind of looks like this just gaping maw of this monster when really it's like a inch long um, coral polyp. Um, cool things you can do, abstracts with color and texture. This is just the surface of a scroll coral. Um, and each of these little bright green spots is um, one of the mouths of one of the individual polyps. But the, all these polyps form this colony with all these beautiful ridges and you get great texture and, and color. Um, this, is a, this is a brain coral. Um, you know, just top down on a brain coral to capture the ridges and the, the, you know, these are, again, each of these little things is a mouth of an individual animal coral polyp. Um, this is the siphon of a tridacnid, a giant clam. Um, giant clams are beautiful. Again, we don't have them in the Caribbean, only in the Indo-Pacific, um, but they have these gorgeous, beautifully colored greens and blues mantles. Um, and this is sort of its um, uh, where it pumps the water out through. And each of these little blue things is basically an eye spot all throughout the mantle. Um, this is a worm, believe it or not, um, a fan worm. Um, there's lots of Christmas tree worms and fan worms. And this is, they, it's basically a worm that lives in, you can't see it, but in a tube that it makes. And this is the, this isn't actually the mouth of it, but this leads to the mouth. But this big feather, so this is called a feather, a feather duster worm, um, just filter feeds, you know, bits of plankton and other food from the water column. And when you get too close to these, or when they detect the slightest change in light, they disappear into their tubes. Um, a lot of divers really love doing. You walk up to them, and they just all dynamically zip closed. Um, this is the mouth of a giant anemone. Um, anemones have beautiful um, colors and, and patterns that they make. I, I love doing abstracts of anemones. Um, this is this is an, a giant anemone closing up um, into a ball with just a few of its tentacles um, still remaining out. And so this is the mantle, the beautiful orange, um, and you get these nice soft um, colors on the on the tentacles. Um, this is another anemone, just, I mean, incredible, incredible colors. Um, and you can really just get these otherworldly um, type compositions, um, you know, just kind of stuff you don't see on land, right? Here's, an, here's another one, the underside of a mantle. Um, and they just, the way they capture the strobes light, because they're, um, you know, somewhat translucent is just really, really beautiful. Um, and every once in a while, with even when shooting macro, you can get a little, get little clownfish in there or something. And um, I like this one again. It's like this fish is darting around. I, <laughs> really hard to compose this. I would have loved to get them a little, little further down, but um, I love this image with the little peekaboo um, uh, of, of the clown. So um, last, I think you know. Type of photography, we're talking about fish photography, right? Like what you might consider like the analog to, to, um, uh, to wildlife photography underwater. Um, it, to me, it's actually not as much fun as, as wildlife photography is on land because it's so much less predictable. Um, you're so limited by the water column. You, you can't, you have to use a standard lens or best a limited zoom. It's gotta be stuff within five to 10 feet of you or it's just not going to be a good image. Um, so you're very limited in subjects and a fish, you know, they don't come, they're wary. They don't, they don't come that 
I mean, they'll sometimes pass near you, whatever, but them posing, they don't perch on a branch, you know, there's some kind of fish that actually do perch on coral, but like it, it's, it's challenging, it's hard. And with the limited time you have, if you go down there specifically with the idea of I'm going to shoot fish, you can come back empty handed more often than not. Um, but it isn't, and, and also in the Caribbean, there's been so much overfishing um, and pollution, loss of water quality and habitat that there's just not tremendous fish life in the Caribbean. It's sad. Um, uh, you know, sometimes there are big fish that are sort of celebrity residents, like some groupers. I think I might have a picture in here, you know, that are known or more eels that, ever, that are, have names because they're, they live in that spot and people always know where to find them. But otherwise it can be a challenge to frankly, to find interesting fish on the reefs in the Caribbean. And it's, it's, it's sad, but that's the truth. Um, you know, fish tend to be really more interesting when they're in big, you know, large schools or when you get really close to them. Um, but one thing you can't do with fish is, or underwater is, you know, on, with wildlife, right? What do we do? Like everybody's concerned about, you know, what's the burst mode? Like there, can their camera shoot 10 frames per second or, you know, the new Z9, 30 frames per second. Uh, forget about it underwater because you're using, you having to use strobes um, in most cases um, to provide your color and your light and strobes can only recycle you know, at best a half second, some of them are one second or three seconds. And so you have to wait, you know, you're lucky if you can get one to two frames per second um, for your strobes to recycle. Um, so it's just a very different experience. Um, but fish portraits are nice. People, people like them. Um, this is a little four eye butterfly fish in the Caribbean. Um, you know, here's where I was able, these kinds of, this is a, called a, a coney, this fish. Um, and they perch on the coral, so they're much easier to approach and, and photograph. Um, a stingray um, in Grand Cayman um, heading right at me. This is an image that I've sold a lot of. People really love this image, um, just I think because of the, the composition of the, the sand ridges and, and the position of the, the fins and everything. Um, but, um, you know, this was a... Um, not one that required, you know, a lot of strobes and burst mode and everything. And sometimes you can, you know, I like to, you know, when, when conditions are poor or maybe when your strobe batteries have run out because you forgot to charge them before you die, <laughs> what have you, you do something different like black and white um, and this, this barracuda. Um, uh, this was just a dark day on the reef. It wasn't particularly colorful. Um, so I think I shot this in color, but I processed the black and white because it just, it was, it was just a more, more compelling photograph that way. Um, but, uh, um, uh, you know, barracuda are always a popular subject. So, um, that's some images. I'll, I'll just, I'll talk a little bit about equipment, um, and the options for cameras. So when I started out, there actually were dedicated underwater cameras that were made. And again, these were film cameras, but there was one called the Nikonis 5 that was probably the most popular um, and widely used. It, it was hands down sort of the best dedicated underwater camera there was. Um, it was an underwater rangefinder camera um, with interchangeable lenses. Um, later, N Nikon came out with something called the RS, which was an under essentially an SLR underwater camera. It had a lot of problems and never, it was very expensive and never really widely adopted. Um, there were lower end options, um, but Nikonis 5 was really the main one, which is why so many underwater photographers were all, underwater photographers were always Nikon shooters because Canon never made one. Sony didn't make cameras back in those days. Um, but those are relics of the film days. Um, and so they're not really used anymore, but this is what they look like, right? This is the Nikonis 5 um, with a 35 millimeter lens, which we almost never used. Um, this was the Nikon 15 millimeter lens. And so you can see, because it's a rangefinder camera, you had to have a different viewfinder that you'd mount on the, the hot shoe. Um, so you could get um, a sense of what the, the, the 15 millimeter lens was seeing. But obviously that far apart, there was a big parallax difference, which definitely affected, you know, because again, this is not an SLR, just rangefinder. So you're a little bit off and you'd have to account for that when composing your subject. And you don't know what you got 
until you come up from your day of diving, get your film processed and can look at your slides, you know, the next day sometimes, which was one of the huge frustrations in shooting film underwater um, is I'd be two days into a trip before I got to see anything to make any corrections and, you know, strobes or my, my composition approaches or anything like that. Um, this was how you would shoot macro on a rangefinder. You think, how, how do you do that? Well, with extension tubes that have a little framer. Um, so you'd know, because your depth of field was basically three millimeters in this, um, in this little part here. Um, and there would be different length extension tubes, right, to get different ratios. Um, this is sort of what, with the Nikon SB105 strobe, this is the Nikon RS SLR that they made. But like I said, it was, it never sold much and it never, it was very expensive and pretty buggy. But even with the rangefinder cameras, right, that's what there was back then. And you could get some really cool shots. Um, I got this one from the Red Sea and I've, I've always loved this one because I feel like it's got a great sense of movement of the of this um, Clark eye anemone fish sort of turning and the bubble tipped anemone sort of sprayed out um, some cool macro on like this this octopus um, uh, was able to get him sort of curled up you know shooting fish was very very difficult with a rangefinder camera but you know was able to get this grouper um, which is frankly not a great shot but like that's about the best you could do for fish photography with a rangefinder camera. Um, they were actually much better for wide angle um, because you have so much more leeway, right? Compositionally. Um, and you could get some really, some, some nice shots. This is um, a shallow reef in Grand Cayman. Uh, but again, you can see what happens when you don't have a really great sun ball. Um, but here's one, you know, with um, my 12 millimeter lens, again, right on top of these sea whips. Um, with the sun, you know, I, I liked what you can see stylistically, I liked to sort of isolate subjects um, to help simplify the reef because there's so much going on. Um, so the other thing that, um, you know, you, that was available back then and is obviously still available now was to use a, a DSLR in a housing. Um, this is sort of like the gold standard, right? Like this is, you know, back then it was a Nikon N90S that I, bought with some of the proceeds from selling my, some of my prints, you know, now you'd take your, your, your Canon R5 or your um, Z7 or Z9 or your Sony, whatever it is, and you can buy an underwater housing for it, which is basically sort of an aluminum, um, mach machined aluminum case that you put on it. Um, and so you can change out, you know, you use your same lenses um, and everything and you just use different housings and ports depending on your camp, what model camera you're using and what lens. The drawback is that these are very, very expensive. They're bulky, they're heavy. Um, it makes traveling with them, you know, you're guaranteed to pay extra for excess baggage and excess weight. Um, and they are, you know, if you think about all the buttons that you're using and all the dials you're using all the time when you're operating your, your, um, your, your DSLR, your mirrorless camera. Now think about having to do that underwater through a housing. Um, and, and the other thing is that every housing has to be made specifically for that model camera because the buttons on the outside of the housing and the dials on the outside of the housing have to match up with exactly where they are on the camera. So you can physically, because it physically manipulates them through the housing wall. Um, so um, it's just, and you have to buy ports for the different lenses you have, lots of accessories. There's a lot of maintenance, greasing the O-rings, making sure everything, no corrosion. To give you a sense, so this is what it looks like, right? This is an Aquatica housing for, this is for the, the housing they make for the D500, the Nikon D500, but they all look roughly the same. And you mount the camera on a plate inside here inside here and you can see all of these things that you know gears that man, you turn out here and it manipulates the buttons and things here and you have to hold one and turn another and um, it's a lot to manipulate all these little buttons especially you know when you're underwater and um, you're going to have big strobes hanging off the sides and you're trying to pay attention to a bunch of other things it's a challenge and this is why you have to be very very 
um, adept at buoyancy control and just very comfortable underwater before you can begin to think about messing with equipment like this. Um, and then you think about having to operate all of this with this kind of limited visibility and do it on limited air with limited time, right? It's a challenge. Um, these are the ports, by the way. So like a flat port is what you use, you'd put on the front here. And so if you're shooting with a, a macro, like a hundred millimeter macro lens or a zoom lens, it'll be in this, but to shoot wide angle, you actually need a dome port. Um, and you know, you've got a much shorter lens here, right? But it's a big glass dome because you've got that big field of view that all has to, you know, that you can't block. Um, and what actually happens, interestingly, is that the image is actually a, a, a false image that's on the surface of the glass. That's what your lens sees. And your lens is actually taking a, your camera is actually taking a picture of the image that's on the front of the port. It's kind of interesting the way it works. Um, but um, that's why you can't have what real zoom, large zoom ranges underwater though, because you can't go from a, you can't change ports underwater, obviously. Um, but you can do, these are much better for photographing fish, um, especially kind of fish that don't let you get close like this fairy basslet um, or um, this um, garden eel, um, little blennies, um, moray eels, right? Things where you, where you can't have extension tubes and things like that to shoot it. Um, it opens up a lot more possibilities. And of course you can do all the, you know, wide angle and, and everything else and macro through these as well. Um, the last thing is the best, like if there were anyone who was sort of looking to get into it, um, would be, um, a compact camera in a housing. So think of like the small one inch sensor models. Um, like your Canon PowerShot G7X series and the Sony RX100. Um, these are small little point, they're not, well, they're not point and shoots because they're incredibly sophisticated cameras, um, but they're, you know, they're small and they have sort of the built-in lens, um, but you do get a good zoom range on those. Um, you know, they tend to cost 800 to $1,000, which isn't cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than a mirrorless. Um, and they're much everything is smaller and more flexible with them. You know, you do compromise a little bit on image quality. You've got a one inch sensor versus a full frame, for example. Um, the focusing systems aren't as accurate. You get less control, but they're, they're actually pretty good little cameras. And so like, and, and this is actually what I currently have for underwater because I just haven't bought a, a how to give you a sense, like a housing for my D500 or, you know, any of the new mirrorless cameras. The housing probably the costs, depending which brand you go with, it's going to cost you between $3,000 and $5,000 for the housing alone. Then you need the ports, which will cost you $500 to $1,000 each. Um, and then, of course, you need, you know, the suitcase to schlep it around in. And then you've also got your, you know, your strobes, which you need with any of these systems. And so it's very, exp it's very expensive. And, you know, once that D500 is obsolete and you want to upgrade to the Z9, well, your, your, your $5,000 housing system is no good anymore unless you, you know, it's only good with the D500. So I haven't made the, the investment yet. Um, I would do it for my Z9, but the Z9 is such a big camera with a built-in grip that it's going to be a big, heavy housing and it's probably not going to want to do it. Um, but these compact cameras are are nice. It's much smaller um, and less complicated housings, um, right? Because they don't have as many buttons and dials. You can use what are called wet lenses. So these are lenses that, so you actually can change from wide angle to, to macro because these actually have a layer of water in between and you can just screw these on the front and off, use a diopter for macro or a wide angle and you can use the zoom function and you, there are actually contraptions where you can screw these onto your strobe arms to carry them around. And so it's a lot more flexibility, but the compromise is image quality. But I've gotten some really cool images, like this is macro of a frogfish. Um, uh, and um, this is a head shield sea slug. And this, this tiny little thing is the size of your fingernail. Um, and I was able to get a really cool macro shot of it. Um, 
you know, they're good for fish photography because they have that good zoom range. So you've got a spotted moray eel. You can also do like fish portrait um, kind of work and you can do some wide angle as well. Um, uh, you know, I, I haven't been to the South Pacific with this camera. So this is from the Caribbean, um, but you can get some nice, you can still get some nice images. Um, this is one um, nod to that we're TechSnap. This is actually from uh, an oil rig out in the Gulf. You can see the oil rig structure and you can see how beautifully encrusted the, um, the, the legs are up close. And that's what they look like far away. That's what I talk about. When you lose color and detail underwater, that's, there's your example. Um, so how do we get that color? It's with strobes. Like I couldn't tell you how to use a flash on land but strobes, you absolutely have to use them. They are your primary light source. It's not fill flash, it's your primary source. Generally, you need two so to avoid getting shadows um, because there is no ambient light filling in. Um, and there's different models of strobes, but you can expect a good strobe to run you between $600 and $1,000 and you need two. And then you need the arms to mount them on. Um, and they have, you know, bunch of dials and everything you know some of them will do ttl flash some of them um, are pure manual um, it can get a little out of hand um, but, but this is this is essentially what a normal setup looks like right this is a small housing with a dome port for shooting wide angle and floats on your arms and your strobes and that's kind of what you're that's what you're using to do a lot of the underwater photography stuff that you normally see so it is a big bulky rig that you're having to carry around and, and you know, it's ballast basically. Um, and uh, it's a lot to deal with. You've got to worry for every individual shot. You have to make sure the strobes are positioned properly. Um, it is a lot, a lot to keep track of. And when I say it can get out of hand, you know, there you go. Um, don't really think that's necessary. Um, but if you don't have strobes, you have pictures like this um where you just can't see anything um if you have strobes and they don't fire <laughs> you have pictures like this right this this shows you you know that's kind of what the scene looks like if you try to shoot it with natural light and this is what the scene looks like with a strobe um and i don't have a lot of other examples of this because i usually call all my ones where my strobes didn't fire for one reason or another but this, I think, gives you a pretty good indication of like how important it is um, to use a strobe um, or multiple strobes. Um, and here again, like you can, you know, subtly illuminate the foreground elements, which help highlight them, like all these colorful sponges and everything here. But you can see where the strobe light falls off, becomes more darker monochromatic and becomes background. Um, so they're just an essential part. So anyway, I've been talking longer than I anticipated, but um, that is it. Um, so I will turn off my screen share and um, yeah, I hope, I hope that was, I hope that was interesting. And it was to me, um, here's the thing. I can't swim. And whenever I see these <laughs> underwater photographs i just oh i wish i could swim well i can i can doggy paddle but i wouldn't be able to save myself but um so i have seen the barracuda a community photo before and i loved it then and i loved it even more tonight nice. but when you got to those abstracts i'm like oh so those those are so beautiful ben because you know, you know, I don't think about doing Mac. I would never even think that you could do macros underwater to get those really cool textures and patterns. And um, it, it was really kind of very, very unique. Very few people, very few people have that image. So you definitely are sitting on those one of a kind pieces. So my first question is, um, are you out of your mind even considering putting a Z9 underwater? <laughs> you can't even get one in your hands now. Right, right. How do you, why do you think you might get a second one? So, well, I, I will say this, knock on wood, um, in 35 years of underwater photography, I've never flooded a camera. Oh. Um, 
which is amazing because a lot of people flood them fairly frequently, including some professionals. I'm just super, super uptight about it. And I check my O-rings carefully and I grease them. And I, you know, um, if you're careful, you can avoid it. Um, Sometimes stuff happens, but I've been fortunate. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to put my Z9 in a half. And I will also say, I had a personal articles floater on my insurance policy for those cameras. (laughs) So that if something happened, I could replace them. But yeah, the, the, the Z9 is not going underwater, but not because not because I don't want to risk it, which I don't, but because the housing would be so big and bulky and expensive. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, in another year or two, Nikon sort of comes out with like the, this, the scaled down version of it without the grip, you know, and um, that'll be a little smaller and everything. And that may be when I make the plunge. Plus both my kids will be out of college, college by then. <laughs> it, it can be about you again. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, now's the time to stick them into the chat. Otherwise there was something I was going to ask you. Um, I'll, I'll, if you could go on one, what's your, what's your next, what is your dream underwater trip? Have you already been on it? Well, yeah, I was fortunate um, after I, um, after law school and after I took the bar exam um, and before I started working, I had about a, a two month break in between. And so I took five weeks um, and went out to the South Pacific to um, Papua New Guinea, Fiji and the, and the Solomon Islands. And I spent you know, several weeks diving out there. That was probably my dream trip. Like it's, it'll never get better than that one. And a lot of the images you saw here were taken on that trip. Yeah. Um, but um, I'd really love, the, of places I have, of places I've been, I'd certainly love to go back to PNG, also for the wildlife photography and the bird photography there. Um, I'd love to go back to the Red Sea. It's very, very beautiful. Um, uh, it logistically it's a hassle and you know you got to be careful what country you're I mean you go from Egypt basically but um, but um, of places I haven't been I'd love to go to the Maldives the Maldives are spectacular um, diving and um, underwater photography and um, but they're they're far away and um, expensive but there is a chance my wife would go to the Maldives with me so there's that there's that you can just cross your fingers All right, then I'm going to close out this session for Ruth. Um, Thank you for coming in and doing this for TechSnap. Um, I can say I don't think that they've had this topic. So this is is nice to have for their catalog. So um, I know when you put together presentations, it's not like something you can do in 10 minutes. So um, I know that your schedule has been really, really busy lately. And... Um, I know that she appreciates that you came and, and helped helped her out by uh, doing this presentation for the group. You guys can connect with Ben on Instagram at Fins Feathers Photos. Did I say that right? Yep. Okay. Next month um, for your April meeting, fine art photographer Paul Malinowski will be here to share his presentation on the 2020 Full Moon Project. And hopefully... Ruth will be here next month and uh, thank you guys for having me. Mm